You know, there's a reason that the church and Christianity are ineffective at stopping the bloodshed in America. And we're going to look at what the word has to say about that right now. While they might play. So with all the crazy that is going on in this country, like all the bloodshed, the literal bloodshed, the gang violence that is tearing cities apart, the mass shootings that are destroying entire communities, uh, the wars and the rumors of wars and the buildup for wars and the figurative bloodshed. Like Bob Marley said, you know, Babylon's system is the vampire sucking the blood of the sufferers. And so you have the healthcare system and the immigration system and the prison system and the this system and the that system, all like leeches and parasites sucking blood away from people, craving blood from society, intent on spreading death and profiting off of disease and suffering. What are the evidence of bloodshed do you see? I'm sure there's others. Tell me in the comment section below. And so the question that I have is, why does the church seem to be ineffective at stopping the bloodshed? Incapable of stopping the flow of blood that is just running all over our society. How is it that in a society where the majority of people still claim to follow Christ, that the society is still bleeding? How is that possible? There's a passage from the Bible that gives us some insight on this, and that will help us to find some better answers for our society so that we can stop the bloodshed. So let's dive into the word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We're looking today, brothers and sisters, at the gospel according to Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 34. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better. Rather, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I only may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. You see, brothers and sisters, this woman with the issue of blood had been 12 years with this problem, right? Could you imagine that? For 12 years, you have this problem where you just cannot stop hemorrhaging blood. To be 12 years and to go to all sorts of doctors, all sorts of physicians, trying to figure out what is going on and no one has any answers for you. I mean, could you imagine that? Not only do they not have any answers for you, but every time you go to another doctor, they make the situation worse. Like, think about that for a minute. Can you imagine how that would feel? I mean, this woman was spent. The gospel says in verse 26 that she had suffered many things from many physicians and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She was exhausted. Imagine being that exhausted where you have gone and you have spent yourself and trying to go here and going there and, you know, making appointments to go here and making appointments to go there and waiting in doctor's offices here and waiting over doctor's offices over there and all over the city, all over the country, all over the world, trying to find some sort of help and nowhere that you turn, you can find help. She was exhausted and she had exhausted 
all. She had spent all that she had, the word says. She had exhausted all of her resources. So not only had she gone all over the place trying to find relief, but she had spent everything that she had, all of her financial resources, trying to figure out what is going on, all to no avail. And so she had nothing else to give. There was nothing left within herself, no energy to go anywhere else, no energy to try anything else, and nothing left monetarily. Even if she had the energy, she had no more money to pay the exorbitant doctor's fees. Doctors have always been expensive, right? <laughs> and so there was nothing left to do. No more worldly solutions for her to pursue and certainly no strength and no resources for her to even try to find any more of these worldly solutions. And so there was nowhere left for her to turn. How many of you have ever been spent? I know I've been spent like where you have done something, then it found yourself in a situation where there was nowhere else to turn, no solutions. You had exhausted yourself in trying to find answers. You have exhausted all of your resources in trying to find answers, all of your financial resources, all of your human resources, everything that you can do and that you could think to do, you have done. Everything that people have advised you to do, you have done and you have found no solutions to your issue. How many of you have ever been spent? In the comment section below, just let me know if you've been spent. Just right. yes, I've been spent. You don't have to tell me details. Just let me know, have you been spent? And imagine that space. Remember what it felt like to be spent and identify with this woman in that moment. Because if you've ever been spent, if you can relate to being spent, then you understand what is going on with this woman. And so she hears about Jesus. By this time, brothers and sisters, Jesus's fame had spread, right? He had just healed the possessed man in the cemetery. Look at the gospel according to Mark still, chapter five still, verses one through 20, right? And we have this demoniac living in the cemetery. This man who had been possessed by demons is living amongst the tombs in the cemeteries. And Jesus called out this unclean spirit from him. You remember this? The unclean spirit was named Legion because there are many. And, he, and the unclean spirit pleaded with the Lord to go into the herd of swine. And the Lord allowed this unclean spirit to go into the swine and drove the swine over the cliff. And everybody ran and, and, and was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And you got to leave and the demoniac wanted to come with the Lord. He was like, I want to come with you. But the Lord was like, no, you cannot come with me, but rather go and tell everyone in the city what the Lord has done for you. And so by this time, all of his fame had spread. So Jesus heals the demoniac and he goes across the, the, the sea, uh, goes across the lake to the other side and the, the demoniac goes back. Now he's healed. He's no longer a demoniac. He goes back into the city and he proclaims the good news of healing and salvation. And so now when Jesus returns to that region, the word says a great multitude gathered to him. Right. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And and when he had saw him, he fell at his feet. So here it is. All his fame had, had, had spread. And this ruler in the synagogue has a daughter who is ill and is at the point of death. And he hears about Jesus and Jesus comes back and all the multitude gathers around the Lord. And this man, Jairus by name, comes to the Lord and falls at his feet and asks him to heal his daughter. Just as Jairus had heard about Jesus, this woman had heard about Jesus. Uh, verses 27 and 28, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I might touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And verse 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, the bloodshed stops and she is healed. Where so many others had failed, all of these physicians, all of these doctors, all of these remedies had failed and not healed her, Jesus immediately heals her. Where no other efforts had given her any solution, any answer, Jesus' answer was immediate. As soon as she had simply touched only the hem of his garment, the bleeding stopped. 
When we encounter Jesus, brothers and sisters, this is the point of that whole passage, right? When we encounter Jesus, the bloodshed stops. But just because we follow Jesus, just because we touch Jesus, does not mean that we have really and truly encountered Jesus. And that's our problem, brothers and sisters. Ours is a society that follows after Jesus, that throngs him, that presses up against him, but is unaffected, unchanged by their encounter. Ours is a society that even when we follow Jesus, even though we touch Jesus, the flow of blood continues to run. It's the same problem that we see in the gospel passage. Verse 24, a great multitude followed him and thronged him. They pressed up around him. They were so dense that they were all bunched up together. Like you ever been to like a crowded club and like some celebrity, some big name celebrity is now in the club popping bottles around the way and everybody is thronging around trying to get up close to this celebrity. And you've been in that crowd and everybody's pushing and everybody is pushing up against this person, trying to get closer, trying to get closer, trying to touch, trying to reach out and get to this person, right? So this large crowd is following Jesus and presses up against him so much so that when Jesus turned around, Around and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples who were with him were like, come on, man. Like, come on, Jesus, really? We in this crowd, dog. Like, what do you mean who touched you? You see all these people around you? The heck are you talking about who touched you, man? Let's just go where we going, man. <laughs> I imagine that's how the disciples talk to Jesus, right? So there was something different about the way this woman touched Jesus and the way the crowd had been touching Jesus. Why did her touch invite healing, invite power to come out from Jesus when the touch of the crowd did not? In verse 34, the Lord says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. See, the woman was healed of her bloodshed because she had touched Jesus by faith, implying that the crowd had not touched Jesus by faith. It's almost like when we talked about a couple weeks ago, what does it mean to walk by faith and not by sight? She touched him by faith while the crowd was touching him by sight. They touched the Jesus that they had seen. They touched the Jesus that they had heard. She touched the Jesus that she believed in, that she trusted, that she hoped in. And so they had come to Jesus. The crowd had come to Jesus. The crowd was following Jesus. The crowd had even touched Jesus. But the crowd did not touch Jesus by faith. They were walking with him on the basis of what they could see. And she walked up to him on the basis of her faith. You know what I mean? If not, check out the video in the car. Not this way. I think this way. Uh, and it'll talk about what do we mean when we talk about walking by faith. This woman came to hope in the resurrection. She hoped for newness of life. She did not simply want Jesus to come with her and go to one of the physicians and get the physician to heal her. She wasn't looking for Jesus to advocate on her behalf and move things to her will. She was looking to Jesus as the source of her healing. And there is a distinct difference between the two. She was no longer seeking earthly solutions to her brokenness. She knew resurrection was her own only hope. And so she looked to Jesus as the source of resurrection, as the source of newness of life. See, the crowd was not yet spent. The crowd had not yet exhausted themselves in search of their solutions. Or wait a minute, are we saying that the crowd had no need of healing? I know we say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but somehow are you thinking that only this woman needed healing? This great multitude throngs him and everyone in the multitude is okay. They have no need for nothing from Jesus. Only this woman has need of any sort of healing, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> See, the crowd though, had not yet exhausted themselves in search of solutions. They still had hoped that the world would have some sort of answers to their problems, that there would be some sort of worldly, earthly answer, solutions to the issues that they were dealing with. And so they still looked 
to the world for answers. At best, they hoped that Jesus Christ might advocate on their behalf, that Jesus would stand up to the world for them and make the world do the right thing, that Jesus would somehow convict the hearts of the rulers of the world and make the rulers of the world still do the right thing and be the right people and so on and so forth. They were still looking for earthly solutions, hoping that Jesus would help them find their earthly solutions. Their hope was in the world through Jesus rather than in Jesus himself. And you see, brothers and sisters, this is where we find the answer and the trouble and the problem for us. Because we are so much like the crowd, you know? We follow Jesus, we touch Jesus, but we still hope in the world. We don't see Jesus as the only solution. We don't hope for resurrection and newness of life. We don't hope in the kingdom of God and the promised land, primarily because we believe that we're already there, right? I mean, the myth of American exceptionalism is that we already live in the land of milk and honey. We live in the kingdom. We live in the city on a hill. We live in the great and acceptable nation. This is the kingdom. So why do we hope in the kingdom when we already believe that we are there? We hope in America. And that truth is clear as we consider your preparations for the 4th of July holiday that is upon us. We will pause to ignore the bloodshed all around us so that we can celebrate and revive the myths of American exceptionalism. We will laud and magnify our empty ideals, we will hold up some sort of mythical picture of America that counters the reality of America. And we will hope to return to civility and some former time when we were great and reclaim what was lost and all kinds of things. We will celebrate freedom and democracy and all of these things that we say that we are supposed to be about. All of this in order to maintain the myth of American exceptionalism, all of this in order to maintain our hope in America, to keep us looking to earthly solutions for the bloodshed that we see all around us. Rather than seeking resurrection, rather than seeking newness of life, we simply hope that Jesus would advocate on our behalf, that Jesus would speak to our one and true ruler, the U.S. government. But if we want the bloodshed to stop, brothers and sisters, we must be like that woman with the issue of blood. We must come to Jesus by faith, hoping in resurrection and newness of life. We must see resurrected living as the only true goal. Now, you may ask, now what is resurrected living? How do I make that my goal? Well, I put together a playlist of videos on resurrected living and how to embrace resurrected living. If you click the, the card right here, it'll take you over to that playlist and you can watch some of those videos and we can talk more about what it means to live in newness of life. Once we understand what resurrected living looks like, brothers and sisters, we can begin to see how the notions of American exceptionalism compel us to hope in America and not in the resurrection. We will begin to understand how these hopes are in conflict and we will begin to understand what needs to happen so that we can reconcile whatever hope we think we have with the hopes of the kingdom, with the hopes of resurrection. Do you see it? Let me know in the comments if you see the conflict that exists between American exceptionalism and hopes in the kingdom, hopes for the resurrection. If we are to hope in America, brothers and sisters, and I'm not saying throw away America, do, do not think that this is some sort of anti-American sentiment. This is a pro-kingdom sentiment. But if we are to hope in America, brothers and sisters, we should hope that we should see America repent and submit herself to God. In theory, America could indeed become the beloved community where there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. But America can only be that place 
if we hope for newness of life and not in some old, deceptive, worn out myth. Brothers and sisters, we must learn to walk in newness of life. We must learn to walk in the hopes of resurrection. And that's what we're about here at Job Red TV. So if you like this video, I hope that you would subscribe. I hope that you would share this video with your friends, with your family. May the Lord give you strength and courage to hope in the resurrection, to see beyond the here and now, not to live in the pie in the sky, to live now but to live now in hopes of the kingdom, to live now in preparations for resurrection, to live now in newness of life, not to hope in the things of this world, not to try to cleave to this world, but to live your life in such a way that when your life shall end, you shall be able to go into the true kingdom. Brothers and sisters, hope in the resurrection will change the way that we engage with the world. I am not saying that we should withdraw from the world and not do this and not do that and not vote and not support and so on and so forth. But what I am saying is that we should not be guided by who we think will do our bidding. Rather, we should be guided by the bidding of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, by a commitment to the Lord by a commitment to newness of life. Newness of life, brothers and sisters, causes us to grow, calls us to grow in new and uncharted ways. The things of old cannot become the things of the present, for all of that is past. And as Paul says, forgetting what lies behind, I press on to the upward call of Christ. We do not turn back in order to make America great again. Rather, brothers and sisters, we march on to make a more perfect union and beloved community, something that somewhat resembles the kingdom of God, where all are welcome, where all have a place, well, where all are cherished and valued and loved, where all can find hope, where all can find peace. Brothers and sisters, we should want to hear like the woman with the issue of blood. We should want to hear the Lord say to us as well, Go in peace, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. Be healed of your affliction. We need the bloodshed to stop brothers and sisters. And Jesus Christ is the only way for that bloodshed to stop. But we have to do more than simply follow him because it is the fashionable thing to do. We have to do more then simply touch him because we want to take a selfie and look like we are down with Christ. We have to follow him. We have to approach him. We have to touch him, realizing that in him and in him alone is the answer to stopping the bloodshed, to stopping the carnage, to making peace and plenty and love and faith and hope abound. May the Lord bless you to see him by faith, to touch him by faith, to follow him by faith, that indeed the bloodshed and carnage will stop. Amen.